You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ and Randy. Ethereum says, Yo, dog, I heard you like forks. More scandal for Deutsche Bank. WikiLeak re- reveals Hillary's serious thoughts, and Bitcoin Unlimited gets some major support. All this and more on episode 178 here on Wednesday, October 19th, 2016. Randy? In traditional markets, we've got gold trading at $1,268.90. Silver is at $17.65 an ounce. Oil is at $51.43 a barrel. The Dow Jones is trading at 18,202 points. And the 30-year U.S. Treasury bond is yielding 2.52%. In the crypto markets, we've got Bitcoin up at $630, Litecoin at $3.80, Ethereum at $12 even, Dash at $10.40. Monero took a huge drop to $3.81, losing nearly 50% of its value from last week. Uh, Steam's down at about $23.4, Amp at about 17.1 cents, and as Darren loves to point out, one doge is equal to one doge. Thanks, Randy. Just a reminder that you can tune into Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss out on a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews? Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, and more. And... We actually have a special episode airing this Friday. We interview uh, Roger Veer, who Bitcoin uh, angel investor and CEO of Bitcoin.com. He's been in the news recently supporting Bitcoin Unlimited, and we discuss how the current Bitcoin block size limit is throttling the Bitcoin network and increasing transaction times, increasing transaction fees, and how Bitcoin Unlimited could be poised to increase the block size and allow the network to scale. So we'll be posting that to neocashradio.com this Friday. That's right. And we have Dr. Tapp joining us for that interview. So if you... Are, are wanting to hear Dr. Tapp's sultry voice, tune in this Friday. Excellent. Yeah. Starting out in Europe. Well, the uh, European Central Bank has uh, written up a paper to the European Union saying that they want tighter regulations and less anonymity on digital currencies. Of course. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> our, our buddy Mario Draghi, the European Central Bank president, uh, is supporting the EU lawmakers directive requiring digital exchange, uh, digital currency exchanges and even wallet providers to uh, license themselves and register with the government. Did uh, they not pay attention to what happened in New York? I don't think they pay attention. The bit license? I, I don't think they pay attention. Okay. Um, but they, then they keep calling them virtual currencies, but, um, they, they do the usual fear mongering saying that these could, uh, finance illegal activities, which cash is also great for, and it's still the number one, and the U S dollar is still the number one, uh, currency of choice. Yeah, criminals for, currency of choice. Yeah. But, um, the ECB is saying that national financial intelligence units should be able to associate virtual currency addresses to the identity of the owner of virtual currencies. So they really want to have uh, know your customer on everything, and they want to be able to point to who owns what. Um, through all of this, though, the ECB wanted to remain adamant that Bitcoin, uh, this is our favorite game, JJ, yeah. it is Bitcoin money. Yes. Um, dun, 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 dun. Well, according to the ECB... Virtual currencies do not qualify as currencies from a union perspective, and they would go on to assert that the euro is the only is the single currency of the union of the union's economic and monetary union. Um, He Draghi even goes so far as to recommend defining virtual currencies more specifically in a manner that explicitly clarifies that virtual currencies are not legal currencies or money. Uh, They would rather see it categorized as a means of exchange rather than as a means of payment. Mm, Makes Um, sense. I mean, it is a means of exchange, and if you don't want to treat it like you would treat fiat, that's fine. Well, and this this is when it becomes really fascinating to me. So uh, even though he made note that uh, digital currencies and blockchains, quote, may have the potential to increase the efficiency, reach, and choice of payment and transfer methods, uh, he was quick to direct members to, quote, take care not to appear to promote the use of privately established digital currencies, as such alternative means of payment are neither legally established as currencies, nor do they constitute legal tender issued by central banks and other public authorities. So uh, even though they think it might be better, they want to be sure that no member states are promoting private currencies in, in any fashion. Um, the, the two problems they're pointing to are saying that unlike the holders of legally established currencies, the holders of virtual currency units typically have no guarantee that they will be able to exchange their units for goods or services or legal currency in the future. So I think there's some folks in Venezuela and Greece and, uh, I mean, even here in the United States, we've got the Federal Reserve devaluing the U.S. dollar by 95% since its inception in 1913. So 
uh, I, these guarantees they talk about are, are funny, in my opinion. Um, they also say that the reliance of economic actors on virtual currency units, if substantially increased in the future, could in principle affect the central bank's control over the supply of money with potential risk to price stability. Thus, while it is appropriate for the union legislative bodies to regulate virtual currencies from the anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing perspectives, they should not seek in this particular context to promote a wider use of virtual currencies. So they're going so far as to say these things might be very powerful and they might be very good, but it will make us lose control and we can't promote them. Right. Well, in, in the subject of control, I guess, we have an update on Deutsche Bank. <clears throat> A Bloomberg article is spreading rumors that Deutsche Bank may be cutting back on U.S. operations as a cost-trimming measure. The New York Times is reporting on a company-wide hiring freeze. This past Monday, Deutsche Bank agreed to paying $38 million to settle allegations that it illegally conspired with other banks to fix the price of silver. This is one in the first of a wave of lawsuits against banks with conspiracy allegations of price rigging and rate fixing in financial and commodities markets. The bad news doesn't stop there. 13 bankers were charged with market manipulation and creating false accounts at the world's oldest bank in Italy, Banca Monte dei Pesci di Siena. Besides Monte Pesci, former executives at Nomura Holdings Incorporated and six current and former Deutsche Bank AG executives were named in the scandal. An investigation found that the executives created false accounts to hide losses. Mont Pesci used derivatives struck with Deutsche Bank to hide losses from an earlier derivative contract. Deutsche Bank's share price has fallen 50% this year, while the world's oldest bank, Banca Monte de Pesci de Siena, has seen share prices fall 84%. This is definitely not good, given that in last week's show and in prior weeks, we've talked about how Deutsche Bank is in a lot of trouble with the U.S. regarding the 2008 collapse and the $14 billion bill that the government has, is suing Deutsche Bank for. That Deutsche Bank says they won't pay. Right. And then, of course, their, their huge, what is it, $47 trillion derivative balance sheet? It's, yeah. It's a, a monstrous. Yeah, I mean, this, this is going to make, you know, when they win or if they fail, it's going to make Lehman Brothers look minute. Right. So this, these, all these scandals are coming out. But I, what I think is, is, is definitely something to pay attention to is the, the amount of settlements that now occur for banks that are being sued on the, the grounds that they're fixing the price of silver and other commodities. Because this has been something that the silver bugs have been advocating and talking about for a long time. And they've been arguing that the, there's market manipulations going on. And now they actually are justified. Now they're starting to see the fruits of that protest. So this is something we're going to pay very close attention to. As you know, in every episode, we mention the price of gold and silver because I think those are always going to be relevant currencies. And it, it bears mentioning as well to anyone who's not familiar with the history of money, uh, when, when gold was first uh, taken from U.S. citizens, when U.S. citizens were required to turn in their gold to the U.S. government, the government bought it at $20 an ounce and sharply raised the price to $35 an ounce as soon as they controlled all of it and held it that way for a very long time artificially. So this is not something that's above uh, you know, banks and, and governments to try to do. Um, certainly we see it with food subsidies and all kinds of other, other things uh, all the time, but market manipulation repeats itself over and over again, and it continues to not work. Well, on the subject of what governments are going to do, WikiLeaks has a sort of damning release regarding Hillary Clinton. Yeah, so all this week, if you've somehow missed the WikiLeaks news, uh, you, you might blame uh, Facebook. They've been accused of throttling uh, WikiLeaks releases and things like that. Uh, all the more reason to diversify where you get your news from. And thank you for supporting independent news sources like Neocache Radio. Neocacheradio.com. <laughs> uh, WikiLeaks has been releasing batches of emails this week from Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, John Podesta, who is also Bill Clinton's former chief of staff. Uh, they've also been release, releasing excerpts from private speeches that Hillary gave to Wall Street bankers. Um, so not full transcripts, but just some excer excerpts have come out uh, via John Podesta's emails. So <clears throat> the campaign and the U.S. government have basically tried to claim that the emails may not be authentic, and they've tried to claim that uh, Trump and the Russian government are behind the hack. That uh, Which Russian government denies. Right. Um, and... Basically, they're saying they're trying to meddle in the election, and now Ecuador has actually severed WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange's internet connection, um, likely under political pressure is what it screams like to me. I don't see why they wouldn't, I mean, for any other reason. 
Yeah. Well, one of the more damning revelations from the latest release is evidence that Hillary Clinton, uh, while talking to a Goldman Sachs conference that she got paid two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars to speak at, uh, is that she would like to she revealed her plans in twenty thirteen that she wanted to intervene secretly in Syria. And JJ, you talked at length. Uh, was it last week or that's right? Last week uh, you talked at length about the sort of U.S. Russia proxy war that's going on in Syria. Well, here's more evidence of it. Um, Quote from Hillary Clinton, my view was you intervene as covertly as is possible for Americans to intervene. We used to be much better at this than we are now. Now, you know, everyone can't help themselves. They have to go out and tell their friendly reporters and somebody else, look what we're doing and I want credit for it. Um, And another thing she said, uh, if everybody's watching, you know, all of the backroom discussions and the deals, you know, then people get a little nervous to say the least. So you need both a public and a private position. Um. Wow. So that's yeah. this. This is exactly why so many people outside the United States don't want her to be president. Yeah, it's Wizard of Oz. It's pay no attention to the man or or woman behind the curtain. Well, and and yes, and the thing you know, and we don't get into the Trump Hillary thing because I think that's a big distraction from the important things going on. Yes, yes. Who gets elected is important on a, on a certain level. But it's not as important as, as the Deutsche Bank thing going on that could crush economies worldwide. It's not as important as these new technologies that could free people the worldwide. But this is definitely something to pay attention to. Now, uh, what there's also other uh, revelations, uh, revelations from WikiLeaks. Or, or what's yeah. this, this next thing? Well, and back to what you were saying about Deutsche Bank with the collapse there, what you need to understand, uh, what people need to understand is that the last time this happened was in 2008 and who took the biggest hit? It was taxpayers. And so that's why we're really focusing on things like this versus the outcome of this, you know, this, this sham of a circus they call an election. That's terrible. Yeah. That's, that's my, my opinion is it's terrible. There you go. (laughs) Well, uh, also with WikiLeaks, um, they, not sure if this was related to the internet being cut or not, but, or the allegations that they're meddling with elections. Um, WikiLeaks tweeted out three pre-commitment keys. Now, this was not something I'd heard of before, but it's basically, it's a cryptographic scheme uh, to prevent unreleased information from being tampered with. So they tweeted out three different things. One said Ecuador, one said John Kerry, and the other said UK FCO, which is their their foreign office. Uh, Basically, behind that was a 64 Uh, character key what this does is it's basically a a hash uh, or some kind of private key that will show when the documents are released it shows that they have not been tampered with so i'm guessing this is something that's going to be coming out after the election basically to say you know this is what it uh, if any of the text were to be altered from the time they released these keys the key would also be altered so it wouldn't match up so uh, it looks like that's uh what it was intended for only time will tell um, and another thing that was interesting was that CNN has come under fire for incorrectly, very incorrectly stating that it was illegal for viewers to possess information from WikiLeaks. And they were saying that the media was somehow special and that they were allowed to look at these things and that their viewers should get all their information on the WikiLeaks releases from the media, from CNN. Oh and my, that people shouldn't the, do their the, own investigative journalism. This is a bafflingly, like dystopian it's what a state-controlled media looks like that's that, that's exactly what it looks like no it's illegal we are in a class above you and we have privileges you don't have and special rights and you shouldn't try and just the fact that you're looking for news outside of us means you're you should go to jail that's ridiculous absolutely yeah. ridiculous well the, the ridiculous news doesn't stop there uh the united the united kingdom admits that it illegally spied for 17 years and it won't stop from 1998 to 2015, the GCHQ's bulk collection program was in violation of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Furthermore, the UK Parliament had several opportunities to approve the program and chose not to. No worries. Last November, the collection program was changed enough to make it legal. Uh, not a surprise. Snowden, of course, revealed all of this stuff. And now it's backed up by the government. But it's still it's legal now. So, you know, don't worry. They've got you covered. Like Yeah, nothing nefarious going on here. Yeah, move along. Well, we're gonna we're gonna switch topics and move to the crypto scene because we've got some some pretty big news. And uh before we get to that though, be sure to tune in on Friday for our bonus interview, Randy. What tell them what's about. We're going to be interviewing Roger Veer. Uh, he's going to be talking about Bitcoin Unlimited. And uh, we do chat with him a little about Ethereum and some of the hard forks that they've 
uh, been been going through, which is what you're going to talk about right now. That's right. Um, but uh, he he's he talks a little bit about Ethereum and some of his sort of backup plans if if Bitcoin continues not to scale. And he does talk a bit about altcoins. Well, so. join join us uh, for Friday's ep- uh, bonus episode with Roger Fur, Doctor Tav, myself, and Randy. We interview him, and it's about a half an hour long. So tune in on Friday, and if you would like, definitely share it. If you're interested in the block debate, that's it's a good episode to check out. But we're getting to, to talk about Ethereum, and they ain't a scared no fork. I'll tell you that. So Ethereum forked yesterday. The show comes out on Wednesday, the 19th. But they forked uh, yesterday, the 18th. And part of it was because of a, a, a big attack that's been going on. It seems the Ethereum network is getting a good test run with a sustained attack ongoing over the last couple of weeks. With a blog post on the Foundation's website that describes the attackers as crafty, the gas pricing system has been reevaluated and fixes in store that will bring gra- gas prices more in line with the computational power they require, making such attacks too expensive to undertake. The fix required a hard fork, which was successful yesterday. Post hard fork, another attack was started and lasted briefly. The new attack focused on the underpriced opcode, further exposing a need for cash expru- improvements. In a Reddit comment, Vitalik Buterin mentions that both of these issues can be fixed with the next planned fork. That's right, this fix required two forks. The next fork will be, quote, aimed at reverting the current state bloat introduced by the attacks. This second fork will serve to remove accounts which are empty. Lacking code, balance, storage, and nonce equals zero, unquote. As if polar opposites with Bitcoin, the Ethereum for- Foundation will fork as needed with a swiftness. This is huge news. Yeah, well, and I'm, I, I'm still not clear precisely on the difference between Ether and gas. Uh, I don't know if you've got anything you can, any wisdom you can. Sure. Okay. So in in the uh, when when Ethereum does things within their contracts, not not saying I'm sending you ether. Okay? okay. So like outside of sending someone ether within the contracts, each operation that you want the contract to do has a certain gas. Uh, it is a certain type of of execution or a certain type of function, and each of these functions has a certain amount of cost attributed to them in gas. And this is something you load the contract with when you execute it, or in some cases your contract could be reloaded with gas. But basically what it is is it's Ethereum, but it's it's a small amount of Ethereum. We're talking, imagine, well, Ethereum down to 16 decimal places with the, the smallest amount of Ethereum being away. Okay. So gas is some amount of way per unit of gas. And this this is sort of what they're reevaluating is the amount of gas per computation. Okay. And so basically what you do when you you have a contract in Ethereum is you 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 create the contract that piece of code and you run it and you include with it sort of a deposit. And this deposit uh is is converted into gas and stored as gas and it's a big number usually. And then as time goes on and as this contract executes what it does, that number gets smaller as it uses the gas. So it won't allow a contract to continue repeating once the, forever. Once a contract or some operation runs out of gas, then it stops. It returns an error. Got it. And that computation stops entering the blockchain and the, uh, the computational nodes and whatnot. So, yes, gas is how you would limit spam. And so okay. what they've done is they've raised the prices on gas so that if you do want to spam, it's going to cost you a lot more. Well, the attacker then found a different way to to attack the system. But in this, in the meantime, it was basically 830 some odd or 800 some odd attacks, but they, they paid a fee for each of them. Mm-hmm. And so they're paying for this to happen. You know what I'm saying? The, the network is getting a fee for each of these these attacks and and it's adding up quite a bit so <clears throat> getting to talk about bitcoin unlimited once again the via btc founder and ceo hypo hypo yang uh, calls for larger blocks in a medium.com article and and his personal blog via P- btc founder and ceo hypo yang throws his support behind bitcoin unlimited quote very simply put if the block size is not increased then Bitcoin's growth will have halted at the level of adoption it is today, and Bitcoin may as well be considered a failed experiment, unquote. That's a very strong statement. 
Uh, Yang levels criticism at segregated witness, saying, quote, The introduction of segregated witness brings with it an enormous amount of technical debt, which would require fundamentally altering the structure of Bitcoin transactions and requiring all nodes, mining pools, block explorers, wallets, Bitcoin ATMs, exchanges, and other applications to do a complete refactoring of their software. The massive externalized costs from implementing segregated witness far outweigh the cost of performing a hard fork, and all of this for a mere 0.7 megabyte effective increase in block size, unquote. Yes, this is something we haven't really talked much about, Randy, is that once all of this this blocks, once the blocks change, then a lot of these external uh, auxiliary functions that use Bitcoin will also have to be changed. Mm -hmm. And so all of those people will have to put additional time and energy into their product or service that they have already finished and completed. So, like, that's definitely a big cost that isn't really talked about a lot. Um, but um, Is this software upgrades, hardware upgrades, or...? It's, de- it's usually a software thing, something they have to program it in a different way. Because so, I know, like, in, the tr- in a traditional sense, like, uh, I've, I've heard frustrations from merchants who deal with credit card uh, registers, you know, that they've changed so much in the past decades that, you know, first it was the swipe machines, and then, uh, you know, the ones where you actually physically swipe the thing on the carbon paper... Then the then the swipe. Now they've got the chip, and it's just uh, I guess protocols are updating very often, and it's causing businesses to have to throw away perfectly good hardware they've just bought. So that that's why I ask. Right, and that's a good point. According to blockchain.info, via BTC has around ten point seven of the network hashing power as of today. Ten point seven percent. Ten point seven percent of the network hashing po- power combined with Bitcoin.com pool, the total hashing power stands at around twelve point nine percent of the overall network. In a CryptoCoin News article, Yang mentions that Bitmain CEO Weihan Zhu, quote, has always been in favor of increasing the block size, but as the CEO of Bitmain, the largest manufacturer of Bitcoin mining hardware, as well as a miner and pool operator, he's worried about creating a divide in the Bitcoin. He's, so he's always hoped that Bitcoin Core would implement a block size increase. Having been let down by Bitcoin Core several times now, he supports the switch to Bitcoin Unlimited. He personally thinks that a switch to Bitcoin Unlimited and a hard fork block size increase is the best way forward, unquote. Now, Bitcoin Technologies Limited, Bit, uh, Bitmain, Bitmain. Bitmain Technologies Limited, manufactures ASIC hardware known as Ant Miners. The company also runs the largest Bitcoin mining pool, Ant Pool, and smaller mining pool, BTC.com. The hashing power of the two comes in around 21.8% of the network. Combine the two pools we mentioned and Bitcoin Unlimited support, we're coming at around 34.7% or more than 600, 600 million giga hashes. Which per per I, second. Yes, per second, which if Darren were here, he would tell us what that is. Darren, um, we need you with your golden locks and your math skills. That's right. Darren, tune, tune in Friday to hear, <laughs> to hear us talk about uh, this with Roger Ver. Yeah. Uh, I want to just point out in something I also mentioned, and that one is that on June, June of 2015, New Cash Radio reported that the, a, a consortium of Chinese, the five largest Chinese mining pools, met and agreed that the block size needed to be raised and that eight megabytes was a good number. So just put that in perspective. Bitcoin Unlimited is talking about two megabytes. The Chinese mining pools have already met and said eight megabytes would work. So that's uh, sort of what what is what else is in play. Of course, that was over a year ago. Well, and Bitcoin Unlimited is going to be opening it up to miners to decide, you know, what what size blocks they want to mine, and so it'll be responsive and and allow Bitcoin to scale. So yeah, these incremental increases they're talking about the point seven megabyte addition for. Uh, segregated witness and things like that. It's it's growth. It's not scale. You need options that can scale. Right. And that's what's you know I'm I, I'm I haven't seen it in action, but it seems uh, that's what's exciting me about Bitcoin Unlimited's potential. Well, and then the fact that there there is very little talk of on chain scaling, and all the talk is focused on off chain. You know, that's it's sort of like let's let's take this simple thing and complicate it and make it more difficult to understand and to use. But for us, you know, we'll, it's good for us because we're making this and we're going to get some sort of cut, you know, some sort of, I just want to taste. So 
Um, what else is going on with Bitcoin Unlimited? Well, it's one, yeah, one more mention of them. Um, basically, there was an announcement recently made that Bitcoin Unlimited would be uh, making several hundred thousand dollars available to developers who could, uh, quote, advance Bitcoin as a global peer to peer electronic cash system. Um, so they are looking at ways developers can uh, help Bitcoin grow. They recognize that it requires uh, ongoing scaling research, empirical studies, bottleneck removal, quality control, and community outreach. So they're they're actively supporting uh, ideas for getting Bitcoin out into the world. And uh, we'll, of course, have a link on neocashradio.com where you can uh, submit a proposal if you are so interested. Uh, one other thing I'd like to bring up uh, this week, I actually watched a really interesting documentary um, called 13th. It's on Netflix, and it's uh, about the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which, of course, uh, abolished slavery, um, so it reads. But there's a loophole, which is that uh, no one can be used for slave labor except if they've been ac accused, or excuse me, except if they've been charged of a cr uh, with a crime. So it focuses on the definition of the word criminal and really shows how the government has created this class of people, uh, largely still people of color, but they've created these criminals that oftentimes are in jail for uh, minimum sentences um, and people who've just been stolen out of their homes and, and out of their communities um, and often put there you know, for a very, very long time at taxpayer expense um, and how a lot of them are actively being used to make goods uh, that are being sold in many, many stores. And so it looks a lot at the fact that we very much have slave labor alive and well here in the United States um, and that it's, it's a growing problem. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's incarcerated population. And it really gets you to sort of take a look at what it means to be in what's called the land of the free um, and when they point out really, really scary statistics, the, the average white male in the United States has a one in 17 chance of being incarcerated at some point in their life. And the average black male has an, uh, average of one in three chance of being incarcerated at some point in their life. Uh, we talked a few weeks ago in a bonus episode with Matt Simon, who's the New England political director and legal analyst for the Marijuana Policy Project, uh, about the painful economics of the war on drugs and how it has, uh, created this whole, swath of criminals, quote unquote, that are now in jail for violent, uh, nonviolent crimes where there's no, there's no victim. It's just, uh, you know, someone using a substance in their own home. And, um, unfortunately it's enforcement for these things and incarceration cost a heck of a lot of money for taxpayers. And, uh, certainly this, this documentary, again, it's called 13th. It's uh, available on Netflix, which is, which I actually take a little bit of an issue with. Um, I appreciate that Netflix put out that money, uh, to produce this, and I think it's very well done, and I'm very, very uh, praiseworthy of it. But it's also on a service that has a you know ten dollar a month fee. That's a that's a barrier for barrier of entry to some people, and arguably the people who need to see this most um, may may have trouble seeing it. So I hope they're taking some efforts to alleviate that. Well, there's an interesting article from this week that came out this week. In fact, it came out yesterday. And it goes, uh, it's, it, the title of it is Why No One Knows About the Largest Prison Strike in U.S. History. And it's talking about how there are 29 prisons in 12 states that, are going, that have prisoners going on strike, across prison-wide strikes for, for this labor you're talking about. The, uh, the article talks about how the prison labor economy brings in around $2 billion annually and employs 900,000 people or more. And some of the companies benefiting from this labor include IBM, Boeing, Microsoft, AT&T, and Macy's. So uh, it's, it's prison labor is what they call it. Of course, they, they don't call it slave labor. But uh, this the, we'll, we'll include in our, uh, I guess we can conclude, include a link to both of them if, if you want. But this article definitely highlights the fact that the prisoners are really upset about this and they're doing something about it. And if they're suffering because of it, well, that's probably better than just going along with the, uh, the, the, the forced labor. So, yeah. And they, they make a good point in the documentary to show that there's more people now being put to this labor than there ever were slaves hundreds of years ago. So that population is actually grown. So, uh, even though slavery quote unquote ended, we actually have more slaves than we've ever had. And, um, it, they do a, a very good job, I think of pointing out things like that. And it was, uh, it was great to hear from the perspective of a, a, a black filmmaker and a lot of uh, just black subjects interviewed in the film about Black Lives Matter, um, you know, and it is it's it is something that affects everyone. So even even being not black myself, um, you know, it, you get to see how 
awful these things are, are for everybody, but especially how people of color have have been forced uh, to live with this their whole lives. And and some of the more interesting points I think are uh, how they've uh, said a lot of this sort of scare tactics of of you know creating this this class of criminals within communities of color has gotten plenty of people to fight you know not just black and white but also black on black people fighting thinking you know and and people thinking themselves are actually you know evil am i a criminal just because i'm black they said that the that the propaganda was so strong from the media and from you know politicians that people actually began to you know some people began to have these awful ideas about themselves just by media manipulation and and these awful um, you know, terms like super predators and things like that that were thrown around by Hillary Clinton back in the early '90s, and the awful crime bill of Bill, the awful crime bill from Bill Clinton in 1994. Very, very much recommend checking out this documentary. 13th. Excellent. Yes, we'll definitely have a link to that on the website. Uh, the perverse incentive system, the pers- the perverse in economies that come from having a 12 to 40 cents per hour slave labor is is just profound. So it's definitely a, a huge thing and. Uh, you know, having such a large percentage of the people that aren't white basically doing this work is is baffling, considering that that is isn't really you know justifiable with the amount of population that isn't white. So right. we'll definitely have information about this on our website at neocashradio.com. As always, you can visit our website and learn more about what's going on with all our our recent stuff. But we also have once again a plug for the Friday uh, interview with Roger Ver. Yep, you can tune in to us, of course, every Wednesday night and subscribe to our podcast on all the platforms that are out there. Uh, our special episode this Friday is with Bitcoin Jesus himself, Roger Veer. Uh, check out neocashradio.com for the links and be sure to be on the lookout for Friday's show. And if you're on Twitter, make sure you retweet all the things at Neocash Radio. That's right. This is JJ and Randy for Neocash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. 